Hello and welcome to our podcast. I'm Danny. Hey, thank you, Daniela. <laughs> <laughs> It's a pleasure to have you here today, Guillaume. <laughs> thank you for taking time to talk to us. Let me quickly introduce you to our audience. Uh, we are talking today with Guillaume Landry. He is the executive director of ECPAT International. Just before we chat here, let me tell people about you guys a little, because your mission, it's outstanding one that is to push for the critical systemic and social changes necessary to end sexual exploitation of children. And I gotta say, I love this bit of critical systemic because it is a systemic issue, right? And the social changes that we need, but we're gonna get there. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's begin, Guillaume, today by learning a bit with the history, right, of ECPAT International. How did it begin and when did it begin? Okay, well, about 30 years ago, there were people in Europe who grew more concerned with the movement. At the, at the time, it was called child sex tourism. So, you know, this image of particularly at that time, Europeans traveling to Southeast Asia for the purpose of sexually exploiting children. So people knew it was happening. They could see it, but they could see as well that nothing was done really about it. So they wanted to have a campaign. It started with just a few countries in Southeast Asia, in Cambodia, in Thailand, in Sri Lanka, in the Philippines, and really trying to draw more attention to the phenomena and say, at some point, this is completely unacceptable. How come we're just letting this happen? And how come we don't have more robust frameworks of action to really address from the source from the countries where the people are traveling with that intention and from the destination, the context where people are just socially tolerating that it's happening. Um, so that that's the movement at its origin. Today, beyond being a campaign, it's a network. So ECPAT is the largest network of civil society organization dedicated to combating sexual exploitation of children in all of its form, including in the context of travel and tourism, but also with technologies on, in sport, uh, in, at home, in school, by other children, name it, in other words, reflecting the complexity of what it entails. And there are 125 NGOs, civil society organizations around the world present in 104 countries or part of that network. Thank you for sharing these details, Guillaume, actually, because we're gonna like ride on it. I think we are sometimes not fully aware of what is behind and what can be like a primary factor that ends up contributing to, you know, vulnerability. You mentioned the internet, you know, you mentioned more uh, contemporary uh, aspects of it. So let's Let's understand that a little bit more, if you don't mind. Like, what contributes to that in the different regions? Because you also mentioned this, right? You are now a network. And I believe that the context must change a lot. But also, maybe some things are, unfortunately, kind of more systematic, I would say, how it goes. Could you enlighten us on this, please? Yeah, absolutely. It's To me, that's really a fascinating and, and troubling dimension of the subject we're working with because typically the image we have in our head is someone who is in, in really in poverty and the last resort becomes prostitution, so to speak, right? Sexual exploitation as a coping mechanism, as a way to survive. And, and that is a reality today that is still affecting great number of children. But... Traditionally, this form is becoming more and more marginalized. Today, we see the problem is growing and it's more complex than it used to be. Yes, poverty plays a, a factor, right, in, in most social phenomena, but that's certainly not an exception in that sense. But the gender norms is also very important. You know, how the construction of masculinity can affect your relationship as well with, with women and therefore with girls and how you can sort of generate that, that power dynamics that is really embedded in sexual exploitation. But another fascinating dimension is to look how the construction of masculinity in boys is really affecting their ability when they're exposed to sexual exploitation to just disclose, to seek help, and how the neglect of, of the dimension of sexual 
social expectation of boys is a global failure in, in many ways. Of course, there are many elements you can think about climate change. So if if your community is 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 making is is finding it more difficult to cultivate the crops, is is forced to move because of more exposure to um, um, national um, natural elements um, and all those kind of things, then again it can become a coping mechanism. Not so much because of poverty, but because of that displacement, because of that fragility that climate change brings. When you think of migration in Latin America, you have to take that into account. Uh, people moving and on the way, sexual exploitation is not just, um, you know, sometimes happening. The more evidence we have, the more it sees it's a fundamental feature of the movement of children around the world, whether they move to seek a better future because there's war, because uh, there's different push and pull factors, children on the move, let's call it in the broader sense. Sexual exploitation is a dynamic that sometimes allows them to move, give them access to the necessary means to be able to move. Sometimes it is a condition to be able to move to the next level of their displacement. Sometimes it's just the vulnerability situation as a reaction of authorities of people of power will use the, the, the vulnerability of those people and then expose them to sexual exploitation. I'd name another example, technologies. It fundamentally, at the moment, it changes everything. So the image that you have of, of a girl on her bed in her pinky room and through the dark web that people are coming through your computer to uh, maybe groom the child, deceive them, made them think that this was going to be um, a, a good um, um, personal relationship that would emerge. And all of a sudden, then when the person is exchanging um, sensitive information or images, then it moves to um, uh, being a context where this was a fake profile and it leads to uh, extortion financially or sexual extortion of that child. It's one of the many manifestations that we see, but Yes, it's girls, but it's also boys. Yes, it is people that we don't know through sort of the technologies. But still today, all the evidence demonstrate that the majority of the children, even through technologies, are exploited by people they know, by their circle of trust. And so that's a critical element that makes, that connects the dots, basically. The research that we have in countries like Namibia, Mozambique, Uganda, the same prevalence of the problem than in countries that are, were considered before as hotspot like Thailand and the Philippines. It shows the epidemic nature of the phenomena. More and more data is are coming that we have a huge number in children in all the countries, in rural and urban areas, in boys and girls, in rich and poor, younger children more and more often than before. In, involve and, and sexually harm online. And that's really changing the dynamic because the reach and the control mechanisms are, are, are very different than what it used to be just to be about sort of physical exposure to violence in the street, right? Where you can have certain prevention mechanism and a more sort of circumscribed audience to work with. Whereas if you're thinking of it, all children today are at risk. What are you going to do about it? Yeah, actually, this is exactly what I was thinking here. And it, I think it takes a, us a minute to kind of pause and take a breath and say, wow, it could be happening like right across the street. It could be happening in my house. It could be happening to my anywhere children. to my children. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's wow, it's, it's actually pretty sad if we think that our children are under such a uh, dangerous situations and i think especially when you mentioned uh this movement of displacement where the children kind of have to they have to undergo this this perils this unfortunate situations to move forward this is this must be devastating i i cannot even imagine how how it is like and now actually you know moving to how do you tackle it? When you were talking about the history, you kind of brought it up a little uh, about your uh, network. That I, I love that this is the word that we're going to use <laughs> because it kind of gives us a sense of like, in one hand, if we think about the problem, it, it makes us feel a little helpless, I will not deny. But then when we think of a network of many people working together, of uh, making it a, a safe net, let's say, 
that uh, has uh, connections, you know, intelligence going on all together to help us fight this. It is a, a, a suiting perspective, I would call it. But could you describe us and explain to us a little bit better how do you act in an international level, but also if you can guide us to programs or maybe approaches that you have to get in touch with these children, you know, take them out of the situations and make them safer. Yeah. I suppose the, 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 the number of years that made me lose my hair is, is bringing a little more humility, right? What I come oftentimes in discussions with the network and with the advocacy, the representation, the convening we're trying to have on the subject matter is to say, let's just be careful. It is a complex phenomenon. And if there was just one button to press and you think you've got, you know, the best invention since big bread, you know, I, I think it's not going to work. And let's let's be humble about it. Right. It doesn't mean nothing can be done about it. But to recognize you need to have a recipe, not an ingredient. And sometimes we want quick fix. Right. So and we see that with the police, for instance, having now there's a push to have specialized police unit to go with softwares and technologies online to detect those those elements. And, and you invest a lot in this. But when you speak to the children, they don't trust the police. They don't even sort of reporting the cases that that space of prevention is not happening, right? Working on the demand aspect of why we're at the stage that this is a growing phenomena is a missing link, you see? So I'm not saying the police is bad or having specialized unit is not good, but we tend oftentimes to put all of our eggs in one basket and then we're doomed to be disappointed over a period of time. If you give me $100 to work with the police, I would want to have a specialized unit, but I would want to look at the initial training of new police who go to the police academy just to make sure that they have basic child protection skills. Do they know how to adapt their language to children? I'd like to have community policing in place so that there's better linkages with the community and people can trust the police. I would want the police to be working with the social workforce and with the justice personnel in integrated units. So it is part of the response, but not necessarily emphasizing the law enforcement strategy, especially in context with the, the victims. You see, so this is just taking an example that you really need different pieces to really move the needle further on the subject matter. So that's a little bit, I suppose, the edge of ECPAT is, okay, there, there's that network of community-based organizations that work across the world on those subject matter. And with the distinction in local context and how it takes shapes, there are different manifestations from a country to another. But ultimately, it's still children. They still experience this, the similar harm and the consequences are equally devastating. But how do you advocate for changes in that sense? And that's a little bit the edge. As a civil society movement is to say, you need a child protection system. You need to have the, the different pathways, referral pathways that will create an, a, a protective environment around children. At this stage globally, there's a zone of comfort. Let's go with legal reforms, regional plans of action, national plans of action that will lead to a strategy and then a roadmap and there's going to be a coordination mechanism. You see where I'm going? A lot of those pieces of, I would say, kind of abstraction that are important, but disproportionately, we stay at that level. You can measure that you've achieved a legal reform. You can demonstrate that you've got a new plan of action. You can take a photo of it. And we like that. But now, decades after, we see that a lot of those things, they, the common problem is they're not implemented. And so by being a civil society organization, a network, you can see the bottom-up approach. The people are saying, you know what, this is all nice, but you know, things are increasingly difficult locally. What are we going to do about it? And yes, there's been in the past decades, you know, three legal reform, but even the first law was never implemented. So at some point, are we serious to really make a difference and create that accountability to children? And that's the edge we're trying to push so that those spaces where decisions are being made with the private sector company, the technology companies, the, the tourism sector, when the 
norms are set globally with UN agencies, that funding decisions are made to try to support more of this and less of that. How can we make sure that we drag more attention to the space where there is that accountability to children? So that's the edge we're trying to push in many of those spaces to have that influence and to speak with, not just on behalf, but, but speak with the people who are there who are seeing it. Maybe one thing I would mention is I found fascinating was the, the data we have uh, compiled with UNICEF and Interpol in 13 countries recently, $7 million research on prevalence, three years of collection of data in seven countries in Eastern and Southern Africa and six countries in Southeast Asia. As I alluded to, same prevalence level. One of the critical aspects that was common across the country is about 35% of the children, when they're exposed to sexual exploitation, they don't tell anyone. The first category of people they would tell the story to is other children. Combined, they represent the majority of the cases. That means that only children are aware of it right now in our communities, except of course the offender, right? Why is it so? Why are children not disclosing even to their own families and parents? Because they don't trust us. Because we haven't delivered for those who came forward, their situation got worse. Because they're blaming themselves already for having, you know, accepted that friend online that then when, you know, turned to be a bad decision at that point. Because of, uh, of basically the, the, this understanding that the system, the reporting mechanism is not made for them. They're an instrument to seek justice against other people, but they're going to be utilized for that system. It's not going to be confidential. People will know about it. They already feel guilty about it. So it's not up for them. And you see that element of saying, hang on, hang on a second, how are we really taking a moment and capture this, right? There is a moment in, in history now where, especially for children who are active on gaming platforms, on social media, that they know far more better than us the technologies. And we're dinosaur, our generation, and we don't understand them. They know better, but we're still the one leading the conversation, depicting the problem in our own understanding and trying to prevent it for them. We're doing it for them because it's sensitive sexual exploitation. You don't want to have an open discussion about it. So it's better to do it for them, but not so much with them. But ultimately what we see is the problem is increasing and that gap increases. They don't recognize uh, themselves and the way we talk about the issue. This is not actually how it happened. And so that, that collective failure is really important. So it's important to shake our three a little bit and say, come on, let, let's take those evidence and take it on board and not preaching for others to change. We're part of the problem too. So we need to kind of collectively own this. This week, there was in Bangkok, the regional meeting of all the Ministry of Labors with the International Labor Organization, with trade unions, and having a conversation with them about this phenomena. How do you connect child labor to sexual exploitation? If a person is exploited economically, there's quite a great risk that it can include, it can lead to sexual exploitation as well, right? Again, it's a region where sensitive subject, but the way you explain the problem, shake that three, but make yourself part equally of the problem and the solution is really important to build bridges and embark people on this rather than seeing, you know, cultural divides and just pointing fingers and finding who's guilty of it. I, I, I think this makes total sense because it is what, what is really behind, you know, these barriers is actually behavior, right? If we think of it from this perspective, it's either governmental behavior or our social behavior or our own individual behavior in our homes, you know, with the children that we have. So it, it is something to really think about it. And then one other thing that particularly concerns me, I think, it's then once you go there and then you find ways to meet this, these kids, you know, uh, tell them, okay, this is a safe space. Come on, tell us what's going on. Are you able to keep them safe somehow after they leave the situation? Because I think this is a next step 
right? It's not just about addressing the situation, but recognizing that afterwards they need to be protected uh, far more probably than they were before. So how how are you able to, you know, and I don't know if I want to use the word ensure, but at least help out with that. Yeah, uh, it's a it's a critical question. At the minimum, even if you have good intention, whatever you're going to do, is it going to, at the minimum, not worsen the situation for them? It's kind of a basic ingredient, like the do no harm concept. It doesn't. It's not enough to think that what you do is good, so you can go on and 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 disturb those very fragile context of operation. At at our level, we don't at Expat International. The Secretariat is based in Bangkok, and we work with the members. But our intervention at the International Secretariat is not to go directly with the children. Because you have to understand that we're coming also with linguistic power dynamics. We're an outsider and we can utilize the children and then dispose of them and then use their voice to go elsewhere. What what good will this create for this child? So you have to be extremely careful. It's It's critical to involve children meaningfully and safely. The best people to do that are those who are locally with them. And it is with children who have gone through a process of at some point disclosing and then and having support in that, where at some point um, having a voice looking back at what happened can be a part of an empowering process of moving sometime from victim to survivor. And it's not it's not for everyone. It's not just to to force anyone on it. So ECPAT in 14 countries, we've engaged with conversation with survivors. And it's important for me, the word conversation. It means we're not coming with our list of questions and we're forcing them to fill our agenda because we're going tomorrow somewhere and we need them to tell us, you know, ABC. It's an open space conversation. And trying to be careful because a lot of efforts in the sector, the stories are terrible. They can be powerful communication tools per se. But then, then what? Always asking that question further, you know, what good will it be for the child again to ding and tell the story for how many more times on this? And what are we going to do with this? Right. So we're, we're careful at creating a space where it's about since it's happened to you, what happened? What has been your access to services? What has been the response of people around you? Where did you see things that were helpful to you and things that maybe didn't live up to your expectations? And from this, can you share what you, how you think this could have been done differently? That's an empowering aspect because they can influence how others will be accompanied in that process afterwards. And it's a critical piece because if you work with the social workforce, community-based program, law enforcement authorities, justice professional, and you can debate whether or not you think the way they work is good or not good. But when you come with that accountability of how people have experienced the system, it's very difficult then to say, oh, that's not true, right? You, you're changing automatically the narrative, like, hang on a second. This is how people have experienced it. So maybe that, maybe we need to revisit a little bit the way we organize our services. Unfortunately, in our societies, a lot of things is about money. Don't get me wrong. We all want more money. But oftentimes, with what we have, we're not doing the best we could. How are we optimizing and investing in people. That's the, the first thing that children are often saying is if, if, if there's something that would have made a difference for you, is it a hotline, a helpline, a program, a database, a registry? Of course not, right? That's not what they would list. What they would list is having someone in their circle of trust or accessible to them that they can trust, that will listen, that will believe them, and I'll be there for them afterwards basic skills skills is not something you can buy with money and that that changes sometimes is like where do you put your priorities then right and if you really want to tackle the issue and that decentralization to get closer to the level around the children is often the missing link i'm not naive it's difficult because countries large countries to reach all the people locally it's a massive undertaking but in a way sexual exploitation is one iteration of so many social issues whether you're working on other forms of sexual violence as we talked about child labor 
murder or or substance abuse or, or criminality, whatever it is, ultimately it's still come back with the same ingredient. Having people that you can trust that can help you in your circle, that should be a major investment that can address so many things. Sometimes being critical to ourselves, and then we push, you know, we want to have a dedicated strategy to fight sexual exploitation. And then we're going to compete and fight with other social phenomena, will come with their own list of ingredients. And then no, no, no surprise that countries are kind of overwhelmed and not performant. We, we're contributing to that kind of um, sprinkling of things rather than structuring a response. So again, part of that recipe, that humility, that understanding really the push and pull factor drives and and just wondering what will make a difference for the children today and tomorrow, not constantly, continually, continuously building something that may deliver in 30 years and, and that continuously being reworked and never sort of trickle down to the local level. Really to... to becomes something that one day actually touches the base for real, right? Doesn't stay just on on beautiful speeches or, you know, just intended actions, but actually converts itself in, in a practical action. It's it's a good perspective to have, Guillaume. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this. But now, Guillaume, let's move this direction a little bit because we've been talking about the issues. Of course, they are highly important. But then... I believe there are also challenges that you face as an organization, right? Not just because of the way that you, you know, um, the things, you know, the matter that you are approaching, which is hard on itself, but also uh, I think at a structural level, I always like to, to talk about this with the organizations that we have here because it helps us dismystify, let's say, uh, what we think that NGOs are, you know, uh, so what would you say there are the greatest challenges that ECPAT faces in this organizational level to keep their, your actions and your activities going? I suppose one of the things that comes to my mind is 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 a, a sad observation that really is 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 globally uh, evident is the shrinking space for civil society organizations, and it's it's fascinating as a network to have organization across the world in Eastern Europe, in Central America, in Southeast Asia, in Central Asia, in Africa, telling us you know that they. The, the, the space for dialogue, for influence, for the ability to interact is really getting reduced more and more by different ways um, so that there's there's um, more regulations that governs the space for those organizations to exist, to operate, to receive funding, to be able to be independent, autonomous in, in, manu in maneuvering. Also, the, the, the codification of the space for them to be able to intervene and, and collaborate with the state, with the private sector, the rules are changing and, and cutting those elements. The funding scheme is, is also very challenging. Even in Northern Europe, I was recently listening to, to one of our ECPAT members there, and the kind of funding uh, envelope they could access before that was dedicated for civil society organization, today are open for civil society organization and state services. So it means that the local police, for instance, will not want to collaborate in a project with those civil society organizations organizations. They rather want to submit their own proposal and through those envelopes get access to more resources to expand their initiative. Very good for the police, but then it's eating up the space for organizations to that used to have sort of those privileged relationship and access to resources to maintain the services now shrink and reducing that, that space. Um, so there's a lot of factors that influence that um, that ability of the civil society uh, organization to continue to play their role. And in many ways, this affects because one of those roles, for instance, is being a little bit of a watchdog to monitor 
what's happening in reflection to maybe the standards, the model elsewhere, the practices that have been developed and being able to challenge, to bring other solutions, to be a bit of that kind of regular external uh, perspective in, into the matter, as much as many of them are actually on the front line providing services in the absence of the state, in complementary with the state, as a partner to the state. So many organizations, a third of our members are directly providing services to children. They're frontline workers in many ways, right? But the, the challenges of accessing funding is really changing the landscape in general. And we can see that a lot of the traditional uh, cooperation agencies from the governments are, um, uh, are debating you know, the, the, the purpose, the mandate, the extent of their envelope for international assistance. And that means that it's it's really shaking the basis of funding for a lot of organization, including ourselves. So it's really a moment of a lot more destabilization. The good news on that sense is there's uh, the philanthropic movement is expanding. So there's more opportunities from that side. They come with different um different opportunities, different rules and modalities of collaboration. Um, so that's quite exciting. And I would also say another aspect is faith-based um, support as well. There's a lot of organizations where actually the proportion of the support they get is mainly from you know, those kind of faith-based networks that they're part of. So it, it, it is complementary a little bit. In some contexts, the due diligence regulations or the, the spirit of um, human rights and business principle brings the private sector as well to, uh, to be an, an another kind of alternative to, to fundraising and to support those things. But all of those three categories tend to be for smaller amount of money and less um, kind of more short term support. Um, so it gives less um, predictability and stabilization in the sector as the traditional way of uh, international cooperation agencies that were bringing sort of multi-year uh, perspective on things. So you see, this is changing. It's always an evolving landscape, but this is an aspect that is really um, affecting a lot um, the, the, the environment per se. We can say as well, the thematic in itself is 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 challenging. It has always been. There are ways to make sure that we can work with the, the forces in a social, political, cultural, religious context that still allow to have the conversation about the issue. And I think the technologies have facilitated that. We had countries that were really of the opinion that this was not a problem in, in their society, sexual exploitation of children. But I think now the technologies are creating a space for those countries to more acknowledge that it is a problem because sometimes um, socially, culturally, politically, thinking that the bad people are from outside and come reach could reach your own children in your country and and expose them to those realities is is evident now with all the evidence that we have globally and so countries are more um willing to accept that this is a risk and address the issue and i'm generally is to say fine let's use that entry point Along the way, you'll discover that the majority of people exploiting children are from our own society. But if we begin somewhere and that's the point of the beginning, let's do that, right? So that 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 is one space. But maybe the last thing I would mention is that children's right, it's to me, it's a new phenomena in, in recent years to see how um, the the there can be clashes between human rights in general and children's rights. That's more evidence with technologies. The regulation of technologies for when it comes to child protection can be something, of course, children have a right to privacy, and that's very important. And equally, those platforms have responsibility and accountability to protect children and make sure that child sexual abuse material are not produced, circulated through those platforms. But there is a clash where the control of those platforms can endanger civic rights and, and the rights to privacy. And that's a very interesting but tense debate at the moment that I don't think I've seen before and where children's rights are getting attacked 
um, for the purpose of, of maybe paying attention to other rights that are equally important. But this is where um, it, th there is a moment in history now we need to be careful of how we articulate this well with nuances. But politically, at the moment, we're not in a world where nuances are really well kind of understood, right? We want to have quick fix and quick messages on things. So it's easy to say that, uh, you know, um, government wants to control the information. It's not good and let's not kind of exploit the concept of child protection for the purpose of wanting to control the citizen and therefore sort of right to privacy is 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 really strong and lobbying against those elements but at the same time you see the magnitude you know just the data from the philippines in 2021 two million children sexually harm online that's mm -hmm. one country two million it's half a million in thailand on that same year so what are we going to do about it? How can we reconcile and find solutions? This, this has always been the case. The, 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 the idea was never to say, let's stop tourism because tourism can expose children to sexual exploitation, right? That's never been our position. But there are ways to be careful at mitigating the risk that tourism can bring. It's the same thing for technologies. But today, this conversation is particularly tense and packed. So it's, 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 it's troubling in some ways how the politicization of, of, of children's rights is, is, is a new edge that is uh, of concern to me. Well, I, I, I think it's so interesting, interesting because after you kind of explain it, it, it makes total sense. But once you said, oh, one of the challenges that we face is actually talking about the issue, convincing governments and society that this is an issue. And then, especially when you clash it with the data that you just brought, it's kind of, it, it, it's so overwhelming, I would say, because how can you deny this reality? I'm not saying that it's the case of uh, the countries which uh, you provide the data, data from, but still it's like, it's, it's, it's kind of, I think the word that I hate comes to me, it's kind of gobsmacking, I'm sorry, but that's yeah. it. because it's really kind of unbelievable that this is a barrier still, right? So it it was just something to, to learn today. I got to say, I got to tell you this, Guillaume. <laughs> um, but now, especially since you talked about uh, the hardships with funding, for the listeners or people watching us on YouTube right now that would like to help out to join and engage with ACPAT's efforts, what would be the best ways to either donate or at least engage with, with your cause? Well, I'm, I'm always careful because the, the tempting aspect is to say, yes, please give money, right? Of course, I'll, I'll come to that. But I, I think we're looking at social norms. It's the greatest influencer in the spectrum of sexual exploitation. What's the space that we accept, we tolerate, that actually creates the condition for sexual exploitation to take place and to continue? Because sexual exploitation is about that, right? Is a child repeatedly sexually exploited and we need to close that, that cycle at some point to get the children to have out and, and move on and not to be replaced by another child. Instead, it will be exposed to that same phenomena. So we all have a role to play on what do we tolerate? How do we construct a society that can that care about this and do its part doesn't mean we all need tomorrow to go and and go as as cowboys and look for pedophiles everywhere right and i take this opportunity to stress that the majority of sexual exploitation is not by people who are particularly necessarily sexually attracted to children it's circumstantial abusers. People in all sorts of circumstances, when there is an opportunity, they'll end up sexually exploiting a child. So it's important in the depiction of the problem to encompass much more than the, 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 the important problem of pedophilia per se. But all that to say, are we playing our role to make sure it's important? And in the small things of building the trust, spaces to prevent, creating an environment where children can come forward when they have concerns and problems, this, this, is, this is all in us, right? And it doesn't require most of the time money to do. 
So I'd like to start with this, right? The second of all is in your community, if there are organizations that works on those matters, and then you can uh, amplify their messages and, and generate a space because we're dealing with a sub taboo subject matter. So it's, it's important that the subject of, of sexuality and children at some point becomes something that we're, we're big enough as adults to talk about. Because if, if millions of children are sexually exploited just in one country in one year, they seem to have been big enough to be exposed to it, but then they're too small to talk about it, right? So they, they, there's something that doesn't work. Uh, we need to be careful. It's not to come with an agenda of imposing something over another. It needs to be bottom up, create the space of zone of comfort. But at some point, we need to find ways to talk about it. Tell me how you can do it in your context. Fine, but but at some point let's let's do it right. Let let's talk about it. So these are elements that I find are, are tangible that people can can just feel that yeah I can contribute to that. And of course, when people have the possibility, they have resources. It it does matter to support organizations of this kind. ECPAT is not a very visible organization. And maybe that's a little bit of a chance, you know, we we don't have funding that comes with high visibility and then we need to put our logos everywhere and demonstrate it that one dollar you gave and we saved 15 million lives. That's not how it works, dry, influencing the context of sexual exploitation. Social norms, it takes time to work on those matters. And we do a lot of things that are very discreet. Recently gathering gaming companies and getting them to discuss help-seeking behavior where their children are, are users of their platform as a space to open up a little bit the conversation because they all have a help-seeking strategy and modalities on those platforms. So how can we work with what they have and then expand and looking at how it's different for boys and girls, for instance, and if children are exposed to more serious types of exploitation, what can be done about it? Engaging that conversation was very important because these are companies that are extremely reluctant to talk about sexual exploitation on their platform. It's just for most of them, they'll say, no, no, I'm not going to come to your discussion. It's not, it's none of my business. So finding discrete way to gather those companies and start a conversation to try to improve what they already have and have a relationship of trust that we're, we're there to try to help to make things better is an example of something where it is useful to be more of a discrete organization, but it doesn't impede that we have a story to tell. So in that sense, this is a great opportunity sometimes to reach to audience who don't necessarily know about this work and wants to support that. Guillaume, I'm, we're going to make sure to add the link to your page here in the description <laughs> of this episode to, so people can get in touch with ECPAD International. Uh, I'm just going to get the, uh, the address here, uh, which is ECPAT, ecpat.org, right? So Absolutely. people can get in touch with you guys and learn more about it. Probably know more also about the specific regions where you act, because that might be also a helpful guide for them to know how to navigate this and really engage in these social changes that we have been talking here and that you highlighted just now. Guilherme, thank you so, 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 so much for talking to us today. I learned a lot. This was a really great conversation. Thank you. Hey, thank you for your time. And greetings from Bangkok, Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> greetings from Brazil. <laughs> All right. Ciao. For, ciao, ciao. And for everyone listening also, thank you so much for staying here with us for one more episode. And remember, if you liked it, if you enjoyed it, share it and press subscribe on YouTube or in your podcast app because that will help us to spread the word. And then we can tell more people about the importance of ACPAT International. Bye, and I'll see you in the next episode.